Hey, that great idea that you've been sitting on, well, it's time to turn that into a reality, and Squarespace is there to help you out. They make it easier than ever to launch your passion project, whether you want to showcase all that work you've been doing or sell all those products you've been making. They have beautiful templates and the ability to customize just about anything, so you can easily make a beautiful website all by yourself. But if you get stuck, Squarespace's 24-7 award-winning customer support is there to help. So head to squarespace.com slash grace for a free trial, And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code GRACE to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Not not too deep. Hello and welcome to another episode of Not Too Deep. I'm your host, Grace Helbig. Very, very exciting episode ahead. We have mother, Palestinian, Muslim, American activist, organizer, incredible human being, author. There's so many things about this woman. Linda Sarsour is here today and I... uh, I'm so excited on your behalf that you get to listen to this episode. We talk about her 20 plus year history of getting into the world of activism and organizing as a resident from Brooklyn with immigrant parents. Her story is incredible, which you can also read more in depthly in her new memoir. We are not here to be bystanders bystanders. If I could talk, sorry, I I used up all my good talking in this interview with her. Uh, She explains the world of organizing in a way that makes sense to someone like me who doesn't really know from the outside. She also has profound and prolific and promising advice for people that are interested in getting involved, but don't know how interested in how to navigate difficult conversations, how to help in the Georgia runoff elections. And she's just all around a lovely, lovely human being. And I hope you get inspired the way that I did after this conversation. I just can't say enough good things. So I'll shut up and let you listen already. Enjoy this episode of Not Too Deep with Linda Sarsour. Linda, thank you so much for being here. I'm very, very excited and I'm eager to learn many, many things. And I can't believe that you had a break in your schedule to make time for us. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Now, for people that don't know you or what you're about, can you give us a little bit of backstory uh, as to how you got where you are today? It, I'm, your memoir will have it all in there for people, but if you can give us kind of a brief overview, that'd be awesome. Absolutely. Um, really, uh, Grace, nothing extraordinary about me. I am a daughter. That's not true. <laughs> a daughter of Palestinian immigrants. I'm born and raised in Brooklyn, which is a very important part of my identity. Um, mm-hmm. I have been an organizer and an activist uh, since the immediate aftermaths of the horrific attacks of 9-11. I immediately started uh, organizing uh, translation services amongst Muslim Americans and Muslim immigrants that were being directly impacted in the aftermath. And I've been a civil rights activist. Um, I organize across the country. I was one of the co-founders of the Women's March on Washington back in 2017. Uh, and I'm also alongside Tamika Mallory, my sister, one of the co-founders of Until Freedom, who have been uh, taking residency in Louisville, Kentucky, to work on behalf of the family of Breonna Taylor, who, as many of you know, ha- was murdered at the hands of the Louisville Metro Police Department. So that's who I am. And I'm an author. I'm, uh, you know, doing my thing, feeling you like are- I'm right. You're doing so many incredible things um, and at a time that it is so wildly necessary. I think one of my first questions is I'm curious about what goes into organizing because we see people on the streets, we see people making petitions, making rallies, all these different things, but it's such a, a more complicated thing than what I as a bystander see. So how do you describe the the world of organizing? Absolutely. I wouldn't call you a bystander, Grace. Uh, I think what you're doing is playing your role like everybody's supposed to play their role, giving platform to people who do this work. Organizing is um, deeper than just seeing people protesting in the street or going out to a march, um, which is part of organizing. But really fundamentally, what organizing is, is being able to influence, to train people, to get people to understand what skills do you bring to the table and how can we leverage your skills for the goodness of the community, the neighborhood, the society, the nation that you live in. And so organizing requires a lot of skills building, capacity building, it's strategy. It's, you know, you have to decide, okay, what is the thing you're trying to change here and who has the power over changing that thing and building Mm -hmm. a campaign around that. So it requires a lot of thoughtfulness, thinking, a lot of strategizing, a lot of building, a lot of relationship building, a lot of collaboration, coalitions. uh, And so it takes a lot of work. Um, and it, for some of us, it's become our full-time job. 
Yeah, for something to like this, it seems like it could be this thing that you kind of do in the background of your normal life and for it to take the forefront of your life. How, how did was that a conscious like click for you or did you kind of get you obviously have lived injustices, have uh, seen injustices and decided to speak up. So was this an organic sort of move for you or did you decide like this is what I'm doing? Actually, for me, I was uh, an aspiring high school English teacher. I was yeah. I studied English literature and I minored in secondary education. And I watched this movie with Michelle Pfeiffer back in the 90s called Dangerous mm -hmm. Minds. And I was like, I'm going to be <laughs> Michelle Pfeiffer and I'm going to in your city schools and I'm going to inspire these young people of color. And that's really what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And of course, after the horrific attacks of 9-11 as a New Yorker, as you know, it was devastated our city. Um, you know, over 3000 people, our fellow New Yorkers um, perished in that uh, attack. But also what happened immediately after that is all levels of law enforcement descended on the communities that I came from. And so what mm -hmm. I witnessed in New York is things that people don't believe could happen in the United States. I saw like apartment buildings where law enforcement would go in, raid apartment buildings, bring men out into the street, lay them out on the sidewalk. Their kids mm -hmm. are watching from the windows. Um, women are crying. And I was, you know, watching from my own window. And I'm like, why is this happening? I mean, these people mm -hmm. live in Brooklyn. They have an absolutely nothing to do with this horrific thing that just happened that also scared them too. Yeah. Uh, and so then what my immediate, um, you know, inclination was I spoke fluent Arabic, which was a language that many people in my community spoke and was their first language became a translator. And so I started going to detention centers across the Northeast, helping women track down their loved ones um, who were unfortunately wow. taken. And so from there is where it clicked for me. Um, I, I, had, I had two kids at that time. And I remember just being in detention centers where sometimes I wouldn't be able to go inside. So I would sit in the waiting area with little children, like six-year-olds whose mothers were inside talking to their fathers and really saw mm. my own kids in them. And so I clicked for me. I was like, look, these are my people. And um, they can't fight for themselves because they don't understand how the system works. They don't speak the language. And so since that time till now, um, I have been an organizer, an activist, trying to play my role in defending what I believe to be the most marginalized people. Wow. And you say you have kids. How do your kids see you? today? Because not only are you doing all these incredible things, but you're making time to be a mother at the same time, which I, I don't have children. I have a dog, but uh, I can imagine that it is incredibly difficult to balance all of those things at the same time. I also have two cats. So I'm a mom. <laughs> um, so I, I have a, my children um, grew up in this work that I've done over the last 20 years. So my son right now is 21 years old. Mm -hmm. I have a daughter who's going to be 20 years old and I have a daughter who's 16 wow. and they to experience my work on a very personal level. Um, sometimes I would have to be supporting their friends' families. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, it's people in the very community that we live in, uh, our neighbors. And so my children are very, have a very worldly perspective. You know, they're not detached from the work uh, that yeah. I do. And I know that they're proud of me. And one of the reasons why I wrote my memoir was, and people were like, why are you writing a memoir? You're only, you know, at the time when I started writing it, I was only like 38 years old. They were like, you're 38, write a memoir when you're like 60. <laughs> you have a lot more things to do. And what I said to people was, listen, I don't know how long I have um, on this mm -hmm. earth. I wanted to give my children something to hold, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, something that told their story, um, mm -hmm. that humanized them and the communities that I came from. Because as you know, Grace, from watching sometimes different elements of the media, the communities that I come from are not humanized. You know, we're mm -hmm. always in the context of war and conflict, you know, in the context of terrorism. And people talk about us in those ways. And so I wanted to put out a story that was a humanizing story of a mother from Brooklyn, you know, of a woman mm -hmm. who had children, of someone who went to public school and I'm a daughter of immigrants, which many people in America are. So there's a lot mm -hmm. of things to kind of connect with me about. Um, yeah, so my kids, you know, have had a rough couple of years, you know, watching their mom go through a lot of difficult moments, but I'm pretty sure that they're proud of me. I think I, they have to be. I mean, it's incredible the work you do and to be so open with them and exposing them in a way that lets them see things and shape their own opinions and their ideas of how they want to exist in the world and help others. I think it's hugely important. I'm also curious because you released your memoir this year and it's been an incredibly complicated year in so many ways and putting your story out there. It, by default is just hugely impactful and helpful for communities, like you said, that don't get to see themselves or hear stories related to them. But at the same time, promoting yourself in a book must have been a little bit uh, conflicted at times. W what was that like for you? 
I am very fortunate to come from a community that um, loves me and supports me across the country. So I didn't really, I haven't really done a lot of promotion on my own book. Others have done it. On my yeah, behalf. you've been very humble about it. It feels like it's flying it's under the radar, but yeah. it's also there. Yeah, like it's not my, it's not who I am. And so I've been very fortunate to have a lot of, you know, Muslim organizations that have, you know, bought them for their schools and, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of uh, Muslim American organizations would give out my book like as gifts for, for donors. Um, a mm -hmm. lot of my friends who are professors around the country who have taken on my book as required reading for their classes. Um, you know, my book also came out in the middle of a global pandemic and yeah. I had a very um, robust, um, uh, you know, tour that didn't quite go the way that it should have went because of the COVID. And I was able to do many wonderful, you know, virtual events, but I'm an organizer. And one of the things mm -hmm. even that was really hilarious about my, my, my tour was, you know, I had this whole thing about how I was going to register voters at all of my events and that oh, I was, gonna, I was gonna, and, and my publisher was like, well, I get what you're trying to do here, but can you just sit on a chair and just tell us about your life like why do you have to organize everything and so i still was able to um you know during quarantine do virtual uh, virtual events and then i've done some actually in some areas some smaller kind of you know of course because of covid uh and and my book has reached i went to louisville kentucky as you know i lived there for a quite mm -hmm. a couple of months and i'm actually going back there again after the january runoffs in georgia and i got there and people had my book like it, i went to the so bookstore cool. i was living uh, very close to a bookstore called carmichael's in louisville kentucky i happened to walk into a random small kind of mom and shop bookstore uh -huh. and my book was right there like when i walked in it was like very prominently place so it's been beautiful to just walk into bookstores um and to see people tag me on social media that they got my book they read my book so i'm i'm humbled by the support that i've received that's so cool um i'm really curious because a lot of people i think have uh finally opened their eyes this year to a lot of things that have they've maybe conveniently closed them to for years and years and I, there's a lot of divisiveness in politics and in culture and the movement and the organizing that you do, what do you find is the biggest misconception for people about what you're doing? Because I think a lot of people are so quick to assume certain things, write off an entire movement or a group of people without knowing the full context of things. Absolutely. I mean, I have been a very controversial figure in the movements that I've been a part of just in general. Um, and because I'm a Muslim woman, I'm Palestinian, there's a lot of parts of my identity that are deemed very controversial. And also there are things that I believe that a lot of people don't believe, which is fine. Sure. I think the conception is that the movements we're a part of are somehow we're all brainwashed and we all believe the same things and we don't. Mm -hmm. Even in the groups that I organize with very on a very like small circle level, there are debates that we have about issues. I mean, I yeah. remember a debate that came up for us during the Women's March where women, you know, was, was, were really like upset and said, well, what if we're pro-life? Does that mean we're not part of your movement? And I said, listen, mm -hmm. we never said we were a pro-abortion movement. We are a pro-choice movement. So if you right. are a woman that chooses your faith and chooses not to have an abortion and another woman has a different life circumstance and she chooses to go another way, women are respected in all of their agency. And so mm -hmm. the thing that I hope people understand about movement work is that unity is not uniformity. There is really mm. not a lot of agreement on everything in the movement. I mean, for example, you know, uh, I work in the criminal justice reform space. People in our movements are abolitionists. They believe in this idea that we should abolish the police and we should abolish prisons, right? And, you know, I'm on the pathway to abolition, but mm -hmm. there are other people who want to do criminal justice reform. They do not absolutely believe that we could live in a world without police or mm. without prisons. And so the question is, how do those people organize together? And so yeah. I want to welcome people into space and to say, listen, you don't have to come to a space and be like, well, in order for me to come and be an organizer or an actor, I have to agree with everything that people say. It's not going to work because, yeah. you know, the space, we don't agree with half the people in our family about things. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. agree with Everyone <laughs> in a space and people we don't even know or at least never like, you know, built deep relationships with. So that's the big misconception that yeah. some people that are agree on everything and it's just not going to work. And I think, yeah, that makes so much sense. Um, and I think one of the things that I've noticed is people are attempting to have difficult conversations that they perhaps haven't had before mm -hmm. with significant others with family members with complete strangers do you have and you've been doing this for years and years and years so a lot of people are very late to your uh your ship on this do you have any tips for people that are curious and possibly a little overwhelmed at the idea of starting a difficult conversation with someone absolutely i mean i actually do this training around the country mm -hmm. uh, i say to people you have you got to meet people where they're at 
And yeah. there's some approaches, as you see on social media is a cesspool. Um, often. Yes. <laughs> and it could be a very productive place where you learn new things, you meet new people, I get to follow people that I may not ever have had, you know, personal interaction with and learn from them. But it's also a very judgmental place. And the, mm-hmm. in order to have the quote, courageous conversation is you got to understand why people believe the things that they believe, what what got them to the point of believing those things, you know, mm-hmm. there must be, ha- have been an experience with them, they may have learned that learned those things from their grandparents or from their parents and be taking people on a journey from point A to point B. And what we have in this culture right now is, you know, Grace is cancel culture. Yes. Grace goes online, says something that it either is misinterpreted or immediately uh, Grace is canceled because Grace yep. is wrong about something. Instead of saying to Grace, hey, so you said something that, you know, really hurt me or I was offended by then. Here's why I'm offended. And Grace can say, wait a minute, that is not what I meant. Or, you know mm-hmm. what, you just taught me something new. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. And so we don't really, we live in a society where we don't give people chances. And as someone who comes out of the justice reform movement, I believe in second and third and fourth chances. I don't believe people are to be condemned forever or or off of mistakes that they have made. And so Mm -hmm. I want, I I tell people all the time, even if it's your grandfather, I mean, like I say to people all the time, if I don't agree with someone in my family, I still love them. Like that's just what it is. You just got to take people on a journey. And so I come from a community where, you know, we have a lot of issues like in other communities, patriarchy, you know, having Mm -hmm. to unlearn sometimes centuries of things that have gone passed on from generation and generation. So I can't just say to someone, you are wrong. Mm -hmm. And then you have no potential of getting better and just dismiss those people forever. I don't believe in that. So I tell people, don't impose your, your opinions on people, take them on a journey, explain Mm -hmm. to them why you believe what you believe, you know, ask them why they believe what they believe. And then together you can take them to a better place. And it's happened. I've seen it happen across the country. It's transformational. Just really where they're at. Yeah. It seems like if you boil it down to more of like a gentle curiosity, that can get you to like a starting point to be able to unpack and unravel, like you said, potentially centuries of uh, unconscious conditioning that people have had. People will ask me like, why do you wear that? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not offended. In Mm. fact, I'm actually happy when people ask me these things that I'm sure they've been walking around with and wondering all these years about why do people do this? Why do you look like that? Why, you know, why do you do these certain things? And I want people to ask me those questions. I mean, if you're, if someone's listening to your show and there's a question that's been boiling for you about Muslims or about, you know, refugees, about Muslim immigrant communities, about anything, Mm -hmm. I want to answer your question. No question for me, stupid. And yeah. I'm not gonna judge you because you are at, you are at least taking the point the, the 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 step of asking a question versus just making judgment or, or off of something that you may not understand. I think that's great uh, because there is you you are a very gently aggressive personality, and I mean that in a great way that you have a very welcoming sense to you, and also a no bullshit meter a bit, which is grace. I can't. I help. know it shows, and it's great, and it's so it's a wonderful balance. Uh, which is I'm I'm curious because I, I was you know going through all of your social media and everything, and you posted some videos. I guess they were like live streams of like you know the night of the election, and you had just such a wonderful calm encouragement of keeping people from going from like A to Z, getting completely overwhelmed with, you know, initial uh, numbers and polls and percentages and all of that. What for you over the last, you know, few weeks has been some of the most more encouraging things that you've seen come out of this election and, and all of its chaos? Oh, I've had so many moments, Grace. I mean, I've worked in six states over the last few weeks and just seeing like the early voting lines. I saw mm-hmm young people that were voting for the first time. I, I met new immigrants who had just became U.S. citizens who are also mm. vo- voting for the first time. Mm. I saw mom, grandma, great-grandma, and granddaughter, and great-granddaughter wow. all together like at the polls. You know, I've, I've had a lot of inspiring moments. I've watched people defend each other at polls where a poll worker will say, you can't vote here because of whatever reason. You know, there was a scum voter suppression that was happening. Yep. And watching other voters say, no, but she's my neighbor. She gets to vote here. And people kind Mm. of stand up for one another. It was inspiring. And it was um, also inspiring to talk to people that were, I mean, I didn't ask anybody on the polls where they they were voting for. I was just happy you were there to vote. Um, Yeah. Just having conversations with people that eventually we find out, you know, 
five minutes into a conversation that they were not going to vote for the people that I was voting for or the person mm-hmm. I was voting for and still having that conversation. So the, the, the election for me was always encouraging just watching, um, you know, so many people go out to the polls and even on the day of elections, I was in Michigan, uh, which was, um, a state that I've organized also in for seven years. It's mm-hmm. a state that has the largest Muslim American voter population in the country. Mm-hmm. And I was moved by my own people. I went to the Dearborn city clerk's office, which is where first time voters can vote on the day of elections, which is very you know, which is a lot of progress to be yeah. able to sort of vote and vote on the same day. And the line was around the corner, like wow. around the back. And most of the people that were on the line in Dearborn were people that were from my community. They were Arab Americans, they were Muslim Americans. And I was just literally, put, we put up a little DJ stand, had some music. We were giving out snacks and water on the line because it was so long and it was uh, great. And I had a great time. Oh, that's beautiful. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. When we get back, I have all kinds of questions about social media. So we'll be right back with more Not Too Deep. No. Uh, It's time to turn your dream into a reality with, you guessed it, Squarespace. Squarespace makes it easier than ever to launch your passion project. Do you want to start a new business? Do you want to showcase the work that you've been working on? Publish the content you've been contenting? Sell the products you've been producing? Or more, Squarespace is the tool for you. They have beautiful templates created by world-class designers and the ability to customize just about anything with a few clicks so you can easily make a beautiful website all by yourself. They also have a powerful e-commerce functionality that lets you sell anything online and analytics that help you grow your site in real time and everything is optimized for mobile right out of the box there's nothing to patch or upgrade ever buying domains is simple and you can get all the help you need with their 24 7 award-winning customer support they empower millions of people designers lawyers artists gamers even restaurants and gyms remember them to help turn great ideas into something real, head to squarespace.com slash grace for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code grace to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That's squarespace.com slash grace, offer code grace. All right, let's talk about social media, because I'm sure in your years of doing this, you started probably when there was no social media, there was no access to <laughs> people from the the comfort of your own home. How have you seen that progression happen, especially in this last year? I feel like it's been more than ever a, a tool for people for better or worse uh, in all avenues. How have you seen it grow? I mean, I started organizing in 2001. That was like still AOL.com. Dial yeah, up. yeah. <laughs> yeah. um, I w- I'm a generation of the beepers. Like I uh-huh. actually feel sometimes like when I organize in college campuses and they're looking at me, I'm like, I'm old. I don't know the big monitor computers. I mean, social media didn't start for me till about maybe 2005 or 2006. And mm-hmm. for me, um, you know, social media is really based how my platform, how I got a platform. I mean, media yeah. again, wasn't listening to voices like mine. You know, I didn't mm. have a platform. You never seen Muslim women in hijab on CNN or MSNBC. And this just, we were just not there. We were like yeah. totally non-existent. And then social media came along and gave everybody a platform and you built your own content. You told your own stories. And so there's definitely for me been a lot of positive that came out of social media, but there, there was also the negative. I mean, when you're, yeah. when you're tweeting, when you have like a hundred followers talking or not even three followers and you're just saying all this, you know, I'm Ron, she, I'm from Brooklyn, you know, you yeah. say some words here, you may said something here, had this conversation, you know how it is. People will go pull up something that you said, you know, 15 years ago or 14 years ago. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, and it's out of the context of your work and who you are, you know how it is, you know, it's just, yeah. that's just life. so, so that's been, you know, um, I think troubling for a lot of people that are, you know, in the kind of same position that I'm, that I'm in. I think, you know, social media is a place where you can't really have, you know, nuanced conversation. I mean, I right. can't, I can't explain to you the things that you want to know in 280 characters. And mind yeah. you, we do got 280 characters. Like <laughs> yeah. you, know, you had to do 140 for a while. Yeah. yeah. You know, Impossible. Facebook, yeah. And Facebook, you know, was a little bit more personalized. I think mm-hmm. Facebook has now moved into a more broader space where you could have followers if they're not your friends and Instagram and things like that. But for me, and I think movement people, particularly black and brown people that don't have a lot of platforms, social media really came in and gave us a way to speak to our community. So a way to speak to the young people and generations in our community. And so uh, as much as I critique social media, I see it as a very helpful tool for, for voices like mine. 
A hundred percent. And there's, I, I'm curious because I've struggled with this a little bit this year and I, I have friends in the, you know, internet space, the, the idea of performative activism on social media, I think people get very overwhelmed with the idea of wanting to participate in some way. And, um, and a lot of people, you know, in the cancer or cancel culture of it all uh, are quick to call people out on disingenuous sort of, uh, engagement in a, in a cause or a movement. How, if you have any tips for people that want to get involved on social media, but also want to make sure that they're not doing it solely performatively. Absolutely. I mean, for me, as people see, you know, my own social media, like I, I, there are people that are like social media activists, like they don't, right. they are not in the street. They just mm-hmm. read about it. And it's very unfortunate. And so that's why there is sometimes resentment that comes. You'll see conflict on social media with people who are actually on the street. I mean, actually organizing people, actually hustling and leaving our families and going to other cities. And then you see other folks who are sitting in the house and mm-hmm. apparently they have, you know, bylines in the New York times. And I'm like, I'm like, but you're not here in the street. Like, how do you yeah. know what's happening in Louisville, Kentucky, for example, with Breonna Taylor, when you're not over here. Mm-hmm. So that's unfortunate, but for regular people, ordinary people, I think it is important for you to use your social media responsibly. I mean, one thing I tell people all the time is, you know, when you hear about a, a case, you know, being able to use your Facebook to say, Hey, do you know what happened to Breonna Taylor? Um, you know, when you are out, I don't believe it's performative. If you go to a rally and you come back and post the photo saying, saying, here's how I felt. Here's why this, why I went to this rally or here's, you know, the more, it's not just, I went to the rally, right. but getting a little more deeper in a space to share a story about what moved you to go to that rally. Cause what might happen, Grace, is someone else is going to be inspired by that and maybe go with you to your next rally. There mm-hmm. is performative activism, but I do think it's the mi- minority of activism. I think yeah. that everyone needs to find their role. Everybody has a place. Um, I remember at the Women's March on Washington in 2017, you know, we had no idea what was going to happen. We were like, okay, great. 200,000 women were going to come to Washington, D.C. And we thought that was quite impressive. Yeah. Uh, and then when we got there, the MPD was like, you said 200,000. And I said, oh, how many people are here? And he was like, about 1.2 million people. And he's like, so that's a million extra. And I said, I don't know what to tell you. Like, <laughs> Yeah, what do you do at that point? It's yeah, kind of like, this is cool. Yeah. Our bad. <laughs> so at the end of the ra- at the end of like the, the the program, I mm-hmm. jumped off the stage. We had security detail because there was like crazy people that were threatening us and stuff. And so I just kind of yes. ran away from security and I jumped off the stage and I went into the crowd. Mm-hmm. I Grace, I've met people that never marched ever in their lives. Wow. Like that was the first time they ever went to a march. Mm-hmm. I saw again grandma, granddaughter, grand you know daughter, entire families, people that were like, oh, these ladies all live in my street, like a whole block from like Arkansas. Wow organized and came all the women in that block Uh. got on a bus from Arkansas and came to Washington, DC. So what I say to people, you know, the women's March was an opportunity, not just to have a March because I've I've been organizing marches for 20 years. Mm -hmm. It was about saying to someone, you don't have to be an activist and organizer to stand up and say, I believe in something, you know, Mm -hmm. that I'm worthy. I'm worthy. My daughter's worthy. My family's worthy. And that was a moment that really inspired a lot of activism across the country. So there were women who now were starting women's march chapters. They were starting indivisible chapters. They were starting other kinds of organizing things where they were helping refugees, doing refugee resettlement, where, you know, they were, do, vote, you know, registering voters on their street in their own wow. neighborhood. They've never done that before. They were like, you know, a lot of them were like, I'm a housewife or yeah. I'm a school teacher. I'm a social worker. You know, I work in tech. That's yeah. what I do. And they even found their role. I mean, the women's march, my team at the women's march national was about 45 women. And they all came from, you know, some of them were yoga teachers in tech. Some people were in branding and marketing. Some women worked in like corporate America. And then there were other women who were activists and organized. And all of a sudden we came and Women's March on Washington happened. And it was till today, it is the largest protest in American history. I mean, yeah, I I was part of the Los Angeles March and seeing it was uh, indescribable the just the feeling of everyone there and seeing the images from DC were just so overwhelming so profound and so like beautiful uh in you know the underlying pain that the whole reason the march is happening mm-hmm. um 
It's incredible. And uh, speaking of women, you have obviously become an incredible role model for women. I, so many messages I got yesterday when I asked for questions for you were just like, I don't have any questions. I just think she's wonderful. And I, I can't get enough of uh, what she's doing. And she's inspired me so much. How does that feel for you? Do you do you think about being a role model for women? Or is that just kind of the byproduct of the work you're doing normally? You know, I never really thought about that a lot um, for yeah. women in general, but I have thought about it many times for women in my own community and especially little Muslim girls in my community. Mm -hmm. And so even when I wrote my memoir, I, I wanted a different photo on the front of my book. Mm -hmm. And my editor was like, no, the photo is going to be your face and you and your powerful face. And I was like, what Why? did you want on the book instead? I, want, I actually had a different photo of, of a rally that I helped organize in Washington, D.C. that had all these beautiful Muslim women that were like at the front of the line. And I wanted to just show because my book wasn't really I mean, it's about me, but it's not mm, about. Sure. And my editor was like, you are you have to understand that you who you are and how you show up in the world is 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 something it's worth something and so when mm. a little girl walks into a bookstore and sees your face on a book like you have to understand that it's not just about you at this moment yeah. <laughs> uh, and so for me i i really um am inspired by when women who are not from my community say that to me or and it's important because you know even i never really considered myself to be a feminist it's not a word that i've ever used before because i never mm. really felt like i would be included in that kind of you know western feminist you know kind of narrative that has happened over the many decades sure. and you know when i went to the women's march on washington just to see you know women there were a million women that were cheering me on they, here's this woman from brooklyn with a hijab you know muslim <laughs> woman a palestinian woman i've traveled the country grace i've been to all white churches um in in the middle of america i've been to the south um yeah I have been in, you know, spaces with African Americans only, Latino communities only, and little girls from those communities will come to me and say, "You are my role model." There's a book that came out a few months ago, also called Muslim. Uh, I want to say it's called Muslim Women Rise, but it's a, basically a children's book, and like I'm in the front of the book with Ilhan and some other Muslim women, and I remember. Uh -huh being at the park with my niece like before quarantine happened and this little girl runs a little white girl runs up to me in the park and she had a book bag and she puts her book bag on the floor and i'm like what's about to happen here? <laughs> yeah <laughs> opens her book bag and then all of a sudden pulls out this book and she's like look this is you on the book uh, and i literally bawled my eyes out like i could i got chills yeah, I literally she ran for her book bag on the floor and i'm look literally looking around like what's <laughs> <laughs> this is a curious yeah. moment. <laughs> yeah, she just opens her book bag and pulls out this book, and it's a, and she's like wow. a little white girl, like literally blonde, blue eyed girl in the uh. park house. And her mom bought her a book about Muslim women, and I thought it was the most inspiring thing. I literally wow. went, went later on and walked up to her mother, and I was like, "I just want you to know, like, you are a great mom, like you are a great." Uh. Thing. And her mom was like, but "What happened?" I said, "Your daughter <laughs> showed me a book that she had in her book bag," and she's like, "Oh my gosh, she loves that book." Oh, she that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, look, listen, this is, I feel humbled um, to have people, you know, look up to me. That's incredible. I also love that even your own memoir, you still wanted it to be about everyone else except for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> you can't yeah. not. Yeah. It's not happening. <laughs> uh, I am curious because I think, you know, in doing all these thinking about like how the world works and why people uh, are the way they are and express themselves the way they express themselves. I wonder if a lot of it comes down to just lack of diversifying the way you um, get your news, the way you get your information. And I, I've been guilty of, you know, watching solely CNN or MSNBC mm -hmm. for and then being, you know, persuaded by solely the way they're, they're presenting their news. Do you have any tips or thoughts on on diversifying the way that you, you that people get their information? Absolutely. I think it, it's exactly what you're saying, Grace. Like I watch everything, you know, yeah. I want to be able to also understand, like my mom always laughs at me because I'm not gonna lie to you. I watch Fox News sometimes. And my yeah, mom no, I put it on just to see how it's being yeah. presented. But, you know, I just want to know what other information people are mm -hmm. getting. So I know how to have and handle conversations that I'm going to have in the world. Um, you know, I think for me, I feel like following human beings and not just media sources is important, you know, mm storytelling for me is important. So reading memoirs, um, uh, not just mine, but of other people, like of indigenous people, you know, memoirs of black women, um, mm. you know, memoirs of people who are from communities that you are not from. Yeah. From those personal stories, not only will you learn something, but you will also connect. 
you'll be like, oh yeah, like when I wrote my book, like a lot of people went to public school, you know, a lot mm-hmm. of people are children of immigrants. A lot of people remember the Brooklyn stoops that I sat on with my family, you know, mm-hmm. and people were connecting with me on such very simple things that I was mm-hmm. like talking about in the book stories. Like, for example, in my book, you know, talking about the horrific attacks of 9-11, everybody remembers where they were that day, yeah. right? Whether you were in LA, whether you were in New York, whether you were even, you know, happened to be studying at Oxford in the UK, like everybody was somewhere and had something to feel about that. So we all mm-hmm. connected. A lot of people said, I connected with you. You, t- you brought me back to that day and where I was and how I was feeling. And mm-hmm. so that's really, um, for me, like the, the journey. Yeah. 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 Now, uh, activism and all of this aside, because there is, and you know, best there, there is a burnout that can happen, um, when you are go, 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 put it all out there. And it's a very emotionally charged work environment that you're in. What do you do to relax? Do you, are there things that you watch? What are guilty pleasures? What are hobbies? I know you barely have time, but if you do ever, what happens? (laughs) I'm not gonna lie to you. I do. I always have a nice manicure. You oh, never, I love it. Never catch me in the street without uh, <laughs> without a nice manicure. That's yes. I became like my thing, my little personal thing. I also, you know, I uh, there's this uh, um, a soap opera kind of thing that's on Netflix. It's actually a Turkish soap opera that huh. over half the world population has watched. What is it uh, called? called Ertuguru and it's uh you know it's a it's like you know uh based in like medieval times or like you know during like the crusades anyway it's a very like love story and like you know war and conflict okay it's very like you know engaging and it's one of the things like I watch it and for some reason I really feel like I'm not in the world at all like I just Mm. went to their world and so that's a guilty pleasure that I found recently uh, particularly when we like when we were really quarantined and it has like yeah. 400 episodes so it's not one of those netflix oh. series like 13 episodes per season but right. it's worth it and it's worth the time so you know that soap opera is um i'm a foodie so i still like food mm. um, it's, it's a guilty pleasure that i have and eating really good food that's one thing where i tell people i'm i can be stingy on everything else but when it comes to food i'm not i want yeah. to eat best um, food and I will eat all kinds of food, every kind of food. There's not a, there is not a kind of food that you can tell me that I would tell you that I do not like. Um, really? The only, thing, the only thing I tell people is like, I just don't eat pork. Yeah. Um, that's it. Other than that, I will eat anything. Um, everything is, is available. Everything's delicious to me. Oh, that's awesome. And I, I mean, do you, the activism, the burnout is, is real. And I, I saw you around the election posting a lot of videos, just sort of like it, encouraging people to take breaks when they can. Is that something that you've learned more this year, especially? I have learned that mostly over the last three and a half years, the most. I mean, I've organized for the last 20 years. Um, yeah. And the last four years, I felt like I organized for 40 years and four years. Um, so there wow. were more where, you know, I suffered very, very extreme anxiety. You know, things were like, I felt like the world was swirling around me. And one day Mm -hmm. I was like, wait a minute, I got to get myself together. And it really were simple things like remembering to eat, drinking Mm -hmm. water, you know, taking those breaks. I hadn't went on vacation for like 12 years before that. And so in 2018, I went on a vacation um, and then I was like, well, this is great. (laughs) and then I went on another vacation like eight months later and then I went on another one and I'm very grateful because there are people grace in this world who have supported me that way I mean people like us as organizers people think that we're like raking in the dough and unfortunately one of the things that I always think about you know is like I work in a field that doesn't have retirement plans you know I don't have okay you know things like that so people around me in my community know that and so Mm -hmm. what they do is like they'll support me like okay you want to go on vacation I'm going to send you on a vacation um, with a mm. friend or something like that. So I've been very fortunate to have people look out for my own well-being as well, but their burnout is real. It's a yeah. lot. I, and people have told me this, look, they're like, injustice is going to be here tomorrow. So like <laughs> think that because you are not doing the work for one day, that somehow like the world's just going to end. It's going right. to be fun. They'll come yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. So I learned that it's hard, but I learned it. No, that's important because I... It's funny that you say that people think that you guys get paid like big bucks. I, I would assume the opposite. And also that like you, you technically your work day is could be 24 hours a day if you let it. It seems like it's the kind of job, like you said, injustice is always there. And so there's always time to work. Yeah. To, to your point earlier about some of the kind of social media activism. I mean, I've had the, a lot of privilege. I mean, and, I mean, I was on the cover of Glamour magazine. You know, I was a Times 100 person of the year, yeah. you know, things like that. 
Yeah. And when people see those things, they assume mm. that because of that kind of notoriety or because you're on the front page of a magazine, like gotcha. glamour didn't pay me to be on the front page. Right. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> they they might have given you lunch on your shoot day, yeah. but <laughs> a nice shirt and pants and be yeah. my makeup. And then I had to give the shirt and pants back after I wore them. Yes. And, you know, you know, a lot of times, you know, particularly for some of us who are more high profile activists, you know, we got we get opportunities um that people make assumptions about. So mm. I want to kind of clear the record of that you know, I feel grateful for where, where I am. I'm definitely not, you know, living in poverty for sure. I just don't want to make sure people know that. But we also do are in a place where, you know, we, are, as you said, are committed to this. This is our lifestyle. It's not just yeah. a job. We don't go nine to five. You know, sometimes like I went to, I lived in Louisville for almost three months away from my family. Um, wow. I'm going to Georgia the Monday after Thanksgiving for the whole month of December up wow. until January 5th. I mean, yeah. these are t- the types of sacrifices that many women that you'll see in our movements make every day. Um, and they're really their families have to make. I mean, it's not just us. I mean, our families have to sacrifice the, the time with us and for us being around them. So I just wanted to, you know, shout out those women to say that, you know, I see them. I'm sure you see them, Grace, yeah. um, that we appreciate what they do for us and the sacrifices that they make. And hopefully one day the best that we could do is that history will remember them and the work that they've done. Absolutely. Okay, we're going to take one last break. When we get back, I have a bunch of questions uh, from Instagram for you. So we'll be right back with more Not Too Deep. No, no, no. Hi friends, Grace Helbig here from the podcast Not Too Deep, which you are currently listening to, hosted by me, Grace Helbig. Just wanted to say a couple of things. One, thank you so much for listening. And two, if you are enjoying yourself to such a degree that you'd love to leave us a um, review on the Apple Store, that would be so appreciated because again you are very appreciated for giving us your time your ears your attention whatever it may be uh and that was my couple of things now back to me me i'm but i'm gonna get into some internet questions and i have two questions to ask every single guest that is uh, on the podcast but before we do that what can you speak to the importance for people that don't know of these Georgia runoff elections that are happening? Because I didn't know that this was something that could happen. And I'm still learning every day exactly what's going on and, and how to direct attention down there. So any insight you have would be great. Absolutely. So Georgia has um, every state has different ways that they work on their election. So in Georgia, when you run in a general election, if none of the two people running get 50 percent or more, there's something mm-hmm. they call a runoff. So in Georgia, both the two Senate seats did not. Neither candidate got 50 percent of the of the met threshold. Right. So they both went to a runoff, which is on January 5th uh, and January 5th. You're going to have two. U.S. Senate seats that are up in Georgia. Mm. And there are wonderful people that are running like um, the Reverend Raphael Warnock, who was the pastor of Martin Luther King's church, the Ebenezer Baptist church. And he's an organizer, very beloved man. And then there's John Ossoff, who many people know had ran for Congress before, you know, young, you know, um, energetic. I would call, I wouldn't Mm -hmm. call him necessarily, you know, he's like a progressive center candidate, but it it makes sense. Georgia, you know. Yeah. But anyway, so there's a, a runoff that's happening on January 5th. And right now the Democrats only have 48 Democrats in the in this in the US Senate. So we get those two, it would make the Democrats have 50. So it would be 50-50. Mm. And then the deciding vote would be Kamala Harris, because that's how it works. The mm-hmm. the vice president becomes the tiebreaker. And so that's why this is so important because it's one thing to have Biden in the White House, and it's another thing to not have a Democratic majority Senate, which could even help move any legislation forward. So what they'll do is as they, as Republicans have done and done in the past to president Obama is that they block legislation because Mm -hmm. the white house is not their party. And I hate that it's partisan, but that's just how it works. So going to Georgia and and supporting and uplifting the work that's already happening in Georgia to register more voters. Um, you know, the voter registration deadline is December 7th, December 14th is when early voting starts in Georgia. And then January 5th is the actual runoff. So we really, really need those two Senate seats. It would be a really, historic if we won those seats out of Georgia. It would be incredible. Encourage everyone uh, to get out, register the vote. And also if you are 17 turning 18, I've heard in January that you can register to vote as well, um, which is important. So, okay. Now onto some really hard hitting questions. I'm going to ask you the two questions I ask every single guest that's on the podcast. The first is who alive or dead would you most like to throw cold spaghetti at? Who alive or dead cold spaghetti? (laughs) 
probably Rudy Giuliani. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Big time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I would ask why, but I feel like I can, yeah. uh, I yeah, can yeah, guess. Just <laughs> post me, <and> that's all. <laughs> okay. The other question I ask every single guest is to tell us your worst pants shitting story or like a bathroom close call scenario, but you can only use three words or three small phrases. So for example, Mine is college jogging front lawn. Oh, Lord. Yeah. Um, a really, a really yeah. hard hitting question for you. <laughs> um, Gowanus Bridge or the oh. under Gowanus. <laughs> Mom. Okay. Yeah, that, that paints a picture. <laughs> that sounds uh nothing good happens under bridges, I don't no, think. <laughs> okay, let's get into these questions from Instagram. Um, okay, first question. How can allies show up or help the Muslim community with Islamophobia? That's a very complex question, I'm sure. Oh, I appreciate that um question all the time. I just say to people the most simplest thing that we can do is to just not be bystanders. If you're ever like at a grocery store or you happen to be in a place where you see someone being, you know, mean to someone who's Muslim or looks Muslim, you know, being able to say, hey, that's not okay. Because I think a lot of times uh, Muslim w- women will tell you in particular that there will be people around and people just don't intervene or at least try to mm-hmm. like be supportive or just, you know, being able to like this, like, like the mom did, you know, the one, mom in the park, like yeah. the lady didn't know who I was. Um, I don't know if she knows any Muslims. All I know is that she bought her little white daughter a book that was about Muslim women. And the, mm-hmm. the girl was so proud to come show it to me. So I know now for sure that that little girl is never going to grow up to be like, I hate Muslims. Like it's yeah. just not. So if you could, you know, get your kids to, you know, watch, shows about Muslims, which there are, um, you know, if you reading books, children's books, there are many of both for children and for, uh, you know, like tweens. I'm actually, um, next year I'll have a book coming out, uh, that is, um, directed towards, uh, like 10 to 13 year olds. And it's called, we're in this together. And it's about, oh, cool. this, you know, superhero activist kind of situation that says it's, you know, has very serious conversations. And then mm-hmm. the year after that, I'll have a children's book. That's a picture book for the more younger generation around like Muslims. I mean, really more, it's like that's, Muslim and who's an activist. That's awesome. Yeah. Cause it truly does. I mean, the best thing you can do is start young just by exposing like you've done your children to the world and to things that are outside of what's directly in their family unit. Right. Um, okay. Someone wants to know, how do you handle personal attacks, either on your character, your family, your faith, et cetera? Um, I feel like I'm an expert in that now. Um, Yeah, I imagine that you've had so many years, especially now with social media, it's coming from all directions. Um, I, if people will notice how like I I do my social media, I don't really engage people who are vitriolic, but I Mm -hmm. do engage people who ask me hard questions. And one of the things I want to say to people all the time is that, I'm not a perfect person. I'm a flawed human being. Um, and they're, and again, you're going to disagree with me on issues. And that, guess what, folks, it's fine. And I want to disagree with you and we can have that conversation. But really, you know, I focus on my, my support network. I have a very, very close group of friends. I have a very, my family is extremely supportive of the work that I do. I have a community that loves me and stands behind me. And so I don't really let it get it to me. I don't let it over consume me. And in fact, I make people laugh at me all the time. I make excuses for people all the time. I'm like, these people are hurt. They're traumatized. They're taking mm-hmm. things. Um, they're taking their anger out on me. I, I, I represent something for them that is not really about me as a person. So I don't just take, the, I don't take social media personally. And I say to yeah. people, please do not take social media personally. Like how can someone that I do not know mm-hmm. have any impact on me? I don't know you. You never sat with me and I've had a conversation with me. So I just don't, I, I mean, I've, it took me a while, but I got to the point where I don't take it personally at all. Yeah, it's a. Uh, it seems like a muscle that you have to constantly kind of work and exercise a little bit because there is so much projection that happens on the internet, and it's truly wild. And uh, and being able to kind of identify that and separate or distance or create space between that, I think, is huge. Yeah, and uh, also, you know, to protect. You know, the one thing about it has been just the part about my kids, like. Mm. being able to have those hard conversations with them. And also there were times and, you know, unfortunately, and even in, you know, kind of recent times where like people like doxed me for my like home address on Jeez. online, you know, I've had people mail stuff to my house, you know, death threats, you know, law enforcement getting involved, you know, your kids are like, why are the cops here? Why is the yeah. FBI in the house and things like that. But again, you know, one of the things that I tell my kids, if, because it's important to teach your kids histories, I've 
had to share with them stories about like Malcolm X and about Dr. Martin Luther King and FBI. Like this is mm-hmm. all part of the thing that I'm doing. Like it's not yeah. nothing new about me. There's nothing special about me. It's unfortunately part of a history of what happens to people who, you know, are organizers and speak truth and speak things that make people feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, this question you kind of touched on, but I, I want to kind of elaborate a little bit more. Someone asked, what does it take to be a good activist? And I kind of want to expand that to what does it take or what sort of activism can and should be happening now that we have voted Biden into office? Because I think a lot of people might think, great, we did it. Work's done. <laughs> Let's close up for the day. But what can you say about what you hope continues to happen moving forward? I mean, the best activist is a humble activist, um, someone that does not believe that they're saving the world. You know, Mm -hmm. I don't believe that I can save the world, but I do believe that I can help alleviate some suffering, some harm that is happening, especially to the people that are in my closest community. Uh, For me, what I say to people all the time, even when the Trump administration took office, I said, listen, like folks, like, I don't know how you all got so mad at Trump. Like Trump didn't introduce me to racism and he didn't introduce Mm -hmm. me to sexism or misogyny or homophobia or transphobia or Islamophobia or anti-Semitism, ableism, all the kind of ills of society. Like he didn't, that wasn't the first time I learned about these things. Mm -hmm. And so for us, you know, our organizing was before Donald Trump and it's going to be after Donald Trump. And even with this next administration, I tell people all the time, like, unless I'm missing something, racism is still here. We still have unarmed black people who are being murdered by police around the country. We still have immigrants who are literally live in fear every day because they think that they're going to be separated from their families. There are still women in states across America who are fighting for their reproductive rights, Mm -hmm. hoping that we're not taken back 50 years. You know, they are that we still have over a hundred million Americans who uh, experience some sort of poverty. We have 200, over 250,000 people in our country died of COVID. Like these still, things are still here, you know? Yeah. So with this next administration, I actually expect a lot more from them. I, I mm-hmm. don't, I don't, I don't actually feel like the job is done. I feel like our job is still beginning. So yeah. what I hope people do is now we're going to go from the defensive to the offensive. And now I'm going to say to Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, you know, congratulations. You are now the leader of our nation. Now to get to work. Here's the mm. things. Do. And so for me, actually, I think, our being in the street is going to be much more productive under a Biden administration than it was under Trump. Because to be honest, Grace, nothing changed. I was marching every day under Trump. Nothing changed. We did not move this administration anywhere to anywhere. They were Mm -hmm. right where they wanted to be and stayed there. But I do believe with with Biden and and, and Harris that we could actually move them to a better place. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I saw someone posting something about the, mind shift of of holding them accountable to the promises that they've made throughout this election season and uh, making sure that you stay on top of them because talk is cheap until there's actual action behind it. That's right. 100%. Um, this is an important question. Someone asked, do you like cheese whiz? <laughs> Listen, I was, te- I was telling somebody the other day um, that this is really that's such a mean thing to say, but I was like, I don't trust vegans because I love cheese. And I'm <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, little, yeah, yeah. I'm a little bougie, Grace, about my cheese. Like, <laughs> oh, we've heard that you you are foodie, and that's okay. If you're going to be particular I'm a, I'm a about anything, kind of lady, you know, I like my my like fresh mozzarella. I live in Bay Ridge, so I live around a lot of Italians. So yeah, able to have access to fresh mozzarella and cheese and feta, I'm very bougie with my cheese. So no cheese whiz for me. Oh, I get it. Okay, uh, last question before we wrap up: What's uh, at the top of your bucket list? Oh, what's the top or, of or generally what's coming up? We've heard some of these new book ideas that will be mm-hmm. springing up in the future. Are there other things on the horizon that you're working on? You know, um, I'm part of a group, as you know, called Until Freedom. Um, mm-hmm. So in our work, we're actually going to go back to Louisville around the Breonna Taylor case. Uh, and But for real, you know, my next thing on my bucket list that I want to work on is I think that my memoir has a potential to be like a very mini series and get people mm. to see these things in a in a more visual way. So I'm going to be uh, working with some folks on trying to make that a reality. That's so, and I think I, I read somewhere that there's going to be a like youth friendly version of the memoir coming out. Is that true? Yeah. yeah. So there's going to be the, what they call the young adult version that comes out next year. And then the year after that, there'll be a picture book based on the book as well. Oh, that's awesome. You have so many great things going on. Um, Linda, before we wrap up, we like to give our guest a, a, a little token of our appreciation from us to you. We have a digital por- personalized fortune cookie that I believe Melissa has emailed to you potentially. 
and you are welcome to read it aloud to the class. Trump threatened to leave the United States if it's confirmed he will not have a second term. This opens up doors to a new kind of travel ban, as in one that wouldn't let him back in. The stars may be in your favor. (laughs) Who knows? Who knows? It's out there. Uh, Linda, this is so wonderful. Thank you for such a great conversation. Where can people find you? Can find um, Empower Change, Until Freedom, all and your book if they don't already know? My book, you can find it. Um, it's called We Are Not Here to Be Bystanders. Um, you can find it where any books are sold. Um, it's also, I have the audiobook version as well. Um, and you can find me on all social media platforms with my real name. So it's Linda Sarsour. Um, and they're all verified. So if it's not verified, it ain't me. Uh, and you can follow Until Freedom at Until Freedom everywhere. So Until Freedom Facebook, Until Freedom Twitter, Instagram, and Empower Change, again, based just our, with the letter M, Power Change, M Power Change. I love it. Thank you so much. This was so great. And make sure, guys, you go check out everything that she's up to and everything that she will be up to. And make sure you're registered to vote if you live in Georgia and get ready to vote in January. Yeah, we'll see you guys next time on another episode of Not Too Deep. Goodbye. Too deep. Too deep. Too deep. Not too deep. With Grace Helbig. Not Too Deep is a production of Grace Helbig Incorporated. Producer Melissa D. Montz. Edited by Shireen Lani Yunus. Post-production sound by Chris Henry and an extra special thanks to Flula for the theme music. <laughs>